Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Kimmler. The difficulties of the American healthcare system are on full display in the new NBC medical drama, New Amsterdam, about a New York City hospital undergoing massive change at the hands of its new director. Let's take a look at the trailer. Everyone in the cardiac surgical department, you're all fired. Oh, I am serious. Amsterdam Hospital. This hospital is a city unto itself. We perform the world's first C-section and the world's first maternity ward. I know the history. The dean makes me tell it to every new medical director. And how many of those have you worked with? Five in five years. Will everyone in the cardiac surgical department please raise your hands? Great. Great. Thank you. You're all fired. Any department who places billing above care you will be terminated. So, how can I help? You know, we all feel like the system is too big to change. We'll call you when we have a doctor available, okay, hon? But we are the system, and we need to change. Let's be doctors again. Going somewhere? I have to tape segments with the morning show. I actually expect you to practice medicine because it's your job. You're funny. We have a patient presenting all the signs of malaria, TB, or... Ebola. I need you to do a throat biopsy. Just take a second. Sure. Uh, for what patient? Uh, me. This girl has been abused three times in the foster care system. If you can't help Gemma as a doctor, then just help her as a human being. Am I allowed to do that? You are now. Why don't you perform half as many procedures as your colleagues? Because there's other ways to help people than by cutting them open. Run the cardiac surgical department. There is no cardiac surgical department. Then build one. Sometimes I join you. Let you Tell me now! Nobody's ever asked me that before. When you're in the line, Working and being able to save someone else's sister. Or someone's daughter. You only show to me. It's a dream come true. They're not gonna let you come in here and just help people. So let's help as many as we can before they figure us out. You need to slow down. You have cancer. But you knew that, didn't you? How can I help? Everybody put your hands together for Janet Montgomery. <laughs> hey there. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. You get to play a doctor. I do, and I get to hold a microphone right now, which is really exciting for me. <laughs> which is more difficult, the microphone or playing a doctor? Which has more responsibility attached to it? I would say probably playing a doctor. Oh. Playing someone who's so much smarter than me. Holding a microphone just makes me want to break out into song. How do you, if you're playing a doctor and you're playing someone that's so much smarter than you, what is the central key to acting smart? Um, forgetting everything I know and listening to people who are smarter than me and hoping that the writers uh, write me good lines. <laughs> and, and speak, I always find speak quickly. That's I, how smart people are. Do you know are. what? And it's especially in an ER department in the, in the ED, it's just like you have to speak quickly because there's so much going on. So that definitely helps. So people don't analyze what you're saying too much. Did you have any trepidation or hesitation about playing a doctor? Yes. When, when, I, when I first went in and met with David Schulner, I said, I love the script, um, but I didn't feel like I was smart. I, I worry about playing someone who's so much better educated than myself and doing a good job of it. And he promised me that we would have real doctors and real nurses on set to help make sure that everything I did, I was comfortable with and I understood everything I was saying. And w that's what we've had. And it's, I'm learning so much. So I'm getting smarter by playing a doctor, which is and great. It was, it's initially based off of a book about Bellevue. Is that, is that, is that true? And was, that, was the author of that book on set? Yeah, Eric Mannheimer, he's a producer on the show and he's on set a lot and he's amazing. He wrote a book 
called uh, 12 Patients, which was about his time at Bellevue Hospital as medical director. And it was while 9-11 happened, uh, the first Ebola case in, in the country. It was all while he was medical director. So the book is incredible. Wow. And what was it like having him on set? I was very nervous of him and I sort of avoided him for about a week. And then when I finally did talk to him... I want to know if it's wrong. Just Yeah, somebody... I was just like, oh, he's really important and I don't want him to... I, I didn't want to draw attention to myself. Um, but then when I... I do when I'm around important people <laughs> right? too. You're like, oh, just blend into the background and hopefully he won't notice me. If they don't know I'm here, I won't get fired. <laughs> exactly. But he, uh, he was so lovely. One of the nicest guys. He's got incredible stories. And the fact that he's still so actively involved with the show is, I think it's important and a credit that we're telling his story accurately. Otherwise, you know, sometimes when people, you base something on someone's book, they don't want to be involved anymore. It's usually because you're not doing what a good job at, their, at telling their story, but he's still very active in the show. I love being around doctors. They tell the best stories. They, they, they've told me some funny stuff, but the one that I found when I met with the head of the ER department from Bellevue, Raj, he said, guess which uh, show has got it most accurate? And I was like, I don't know, ER, uh, Grey's Anatomy. And he was like, no, Scrubs. And I was like, and that blew my mind. But I was like, actually, the more time I spend with real doctors, the more I can see that being true. They've got what, a good sense of humor. And what, oh, yeah, of course. The macabre sense of humor a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that what it is that makes them the most accurate, that it's a, the sense of humor? I think when you're around people who are that smart and that they're going through... It becomes their daily their daily life going through such tragedy or or miracles, you know, babies being born, that they they have a dry sense of humour underlying across everything, which I think you probably need, otherwise you wouldn't survive. Right, you wouldn't necessarily have this kind of intensity that a medical drama has when you're working in a hospital because you wouldn't be able to survive that way. No. Yeah. No, I think that's true. Uh, so you're working with Ryan uh, Eggold, who's 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 the one of the leads with you on the show. What's it like working with him? I mean, he, he's fine. You know, he's not obviously an, a really ugly guy, so that's tough. Um, Hard to look at. <laughs> I met him, and I was like, oh, jeez. No, Ryan is amazing. He's super, super lovely. He's incredibly witty, which I don't think I was prepared for. Like, he's much funnier because I'd seen some of his work and wasn't really expecting him to be quite so witty. And we, our dressing rooms on the stage that we work on, we share a bathroom. So we're often like walking into on, in on each other while we're on the toilet. So yeah, we've got a really close relationship now. <laughs> and tell me uh, about your character specifically. Um, I play Dr. Lauren Bloom and I run the ED department at New Amsterdam. Uh, she's very high energy, which I think is what you would expect from someone who it runs an ED department. She's, you know, ADHD. She definitely has her fingers in a lot of pies. Uh, I think she's someone that doesn't really like to be alone. And her job is her life. You know, it's you would, could say it's killing her in some ways, but really it's the one thing that's keeping her alive as well as a person. When you say she doesn't really like to be alone, I've seen um, the pilot, and I didn't really pick up on the aspect of her that she didn't want to be alone. Not that I picked up on something different, mm -hmm. but I think that's kind of cool that that's something that you as an actor probably grabbed onto for your performance. Where did you find that in the character? I, I found it that she never wanted to unwind. Like, she wasn't someone that, like, after a day of work was someone that was like, oh, I'm going to go home and have, like, a long bath, which is sort of what I feel like. She's someone who, she wants to go, she'll go moonlight at another hospital, and it's not necessarily for financial reasons. It's more that she has to stay on. She's one of those, you know, you meet those people who are just always on. It's like comedians are like it a lot. She's one of those people. The doctors are like that a lot, too. Not in the sense that because of all of the emergency, but because they decided to practice medicine, they love practicing mm -hmm. medicine, and they're always looking for a place that they can do it in different ways and learn more. They're such fascinating people. I mean, I think the pressure that you're under as a doctor, most people think that they have a high pressure job no matter what it is, but it's not saving lives. There's a joke always on set when we're like running over or we're like haven't got something. It's like, oh, we're not saving lives. But when you're a doctor, that is your job. So how can you say no if someone needs you, it, it must be very difficult. Yeah. You're involved in a pretty uh, gory scene in the in the pilot without giving anything away because it hasn't premiered yet, right? No, it tomorrow. Tomorrow. Night. tomorrow. Uh, what was it like shooting that scene with all the blood and everything? It was, there was, I've done horror movies before, so I can't believe I didn't think of this before we were shooting. I was fine with all the blood, but fake blood gets very sticky 
and suddenly everything starts sticking to it. So when I was trying to do the like the medical stuff, like my gloves and everything was sticking to the other actor, and it was like <laughs> it just you can't move. You're like, oh, we need to wet the blood because I'm we're stuck together now, and or I couldn't pick up the the scalpel or whatever. It was yeah, it was tough. <laughs> what I'm sorry, what horror movies have you had, had you have you done? Um, I've been in a sequel called Wrong Turn Three. Oh. Yes, yeah, back in the day, and another one called uh, The Hills Run Red. The Hills Run Red. Mm. Oh, were you a horror movie fan going into those, or were they like... No, jobs, but like... I, do, horror movies scare me. I'm not great at watching... Because I'm a, I'm a good audience for scary movies because I'm quite reactive. So I was, you know, I was at the cinema the other day, and the trailer for The Nun came on, and I screamed at the bit where you're like, "Oh, she's right behind, she's right behind," and then one jumps out from the side. Like I'm a, I'm a real screamer. So it's too much on my nervous system to watch a horror movie. <laughs> but you don't feel that necessarily when you're shooting them, right? No, it's fun when you're shooting them. Yeah, it's, it's you don't get the say. It's more for the audience. It's all the suspense, isn't it? Really, when you're shooting it, it's all right there. You can see it all. And it's not really a horror movie, but you were in Black Swan. It's kind of a psychological thriller. Yeah, thriller yeah. for sure, yeah. Were you, uh, were, did you have any scenes in that that were somewhat scary? I mean, I, I auditioned for that movie and was lucky enough that Darren really liked me, but I was I auditioned for Winona Ryder's part, and he was like, I was, I don't know, 24 at the time, and he was like, you're too young for this part, um, but I think you're great. And then he wrote me in a very small part in the movie, and I was there shooting with them for seven weeks in New York, um, and I was dancing with like the people from NYU and from Pennsylvania Ballet. And you know, I think in the in the final movie, I just have a couple of lines, but it was an incredible experience to yeah. be part of. What part was of that. that like watching him work for seven weeks? Because I mean, if you only if you end up having just a couple lines, but you're there, you're essentially probably watching the crew and watching him work and getting the chance to watch someone who works. I would say in a much different way than most other directors. Yeah, work. I, he's he's incredible. I mean, he's. He's a genius, and I think you can see that in his work. Uh, him and Matty Libertique, who's his cinematographer, they were finding new ways to shoot things. You know, they were building things to put the camera on and spinning the camera as Natalie was doing pirouettes in order to give it like an extra spin. So the camera spins the opposite direction at the same time. It was, yeah, I learned a lot. I can't say that I would ever be able to direct a movie as well, but I was just like, oh, this is amazing. But I imagine it's a completely different experience than like, you know, you go from doing that for seven weeks to jump on like wrong turn three or something and see how yeah, it's a little that different. is made. It is, yeah. it is a little different, yes. I, mean, not, I don't mean any disrespect to the whoever directed wrong turn three, mm -hmm. but I'd imagine you're watching one person do everything they can to break the rules mm -hmm. and, and make something, and you're watching another person you know, try to get through making this, this I movie. I think what is special about Darren as a director and why his movies are quite divided. Some people love uh, or hate other things is he goes out, he pushes boundaries. He's not just someone that's trying to make something that's safe and that everyone commercially will go, oh yes, this is a great movie. He's doing things artistically that are gonna divide people and maybe sometimes they won't work and sometimes they will. And I think that's the true mark of someone who is a genius because they're willing to push things further. I think you're also, uh, you've got an episode of the Romanoffs coming up, which is another, by another genius who sometimes divides people, not so much as maybe Darren Aronofsky, but I mm -hmm. think he, sometimes people like or dislike Mad Men, depending on what they think of it. I love Mad Men so much. I loved Mad Men. And I was, you know, I, I didn't actually watch Mad Men before I, I met with Matt Weiner for the Romanoffs. Yeah, I hadn't watched it. You know, it was one of those shows that everyone was telling me about, but I was already like four seasons behind. So I was like, oh, I can't get into that. Then I got the job and I was like, okay, now I'm gonna watch it. And I watched, in three months, I burned through the whole seven seasons of Mad Men. It's so satisfying. It's such a satisfying it's show. It's so brilliant. And you know, the way he writes characters and relationships is, it's, so, it, it's it, you know, it's just like some of the best writing I've seen. And women as well, like the fact that you have really strong feminist characters who are also really feminine and sexy is something I hadn't really seen before. Like Joan is like something that I've never seen in another show before. She's such a great character. And, and even when they had those those those, those feminist storylines and it never felt like they were trying to send a message or prove a point or be a part of some kind of like water cooler conversation. It always felt uh, specific to the character and the time and what the show was about. And they were three dimensional. They weren't, they, you weren't like, oh, I really like Betty. She's the good wife. You, she was com she was complex. She was also like childlike, and she played on her sexuality in like a girly way. And then you had someone like Joan, who was kind of slutty and used her sexuality in a certain way. But she was also I didn't feel like he'd put people in boxes. He let women be three dimensional and be unlikable and likable and 
that wasn't it wasn't like oh i'm creating this kind of woman this woman's the femme fatale and this woman is the stay at home wife i mean looking back on it just now in this conversation i feel like the women of that show were possibly more three dimensional than than the men i'm thinking back at like you know, Don and mm-hmm. Roger and the other men. And I'm like, oh, those are so much. Pete Campbell was a great character. Maybe a little, yeah. Yeah, maybe, and he had the biggest arc. Yeah, he was, I mean, you hated him after he got uh, Peggy pregnant. I think you hated him so much in this show. And you so thought, well, times. I'm never going to like this character. I'm never, and by the end, you do. You kind of feel for Pete and you think that actually, out of all the characters, he's grown the most. Yeah, it was amazing. It's, that's a sign of like great writing. I just recently saw the episode where Pete has a brief fling with the nanny that lives in the apartment next door. Fling is a very generous word yeah. for what he ends up having with her. And you hate him so much. And then by the end, he's just you don't feel for him, but you're like, oh, he's just a weak, pathetic man. And mm-hmm. of course he did this. The show has such a great way of turning it around on him. He's so insecure, Pete. Yes. And I think that's why you end up feeling sorry for him because he's trying to be something that he's not. And like, and he's like moved to the city and he's having mistresses and stuff. But it's not necessarily that he's a... I don't believe in good people and bad people, especially in storytelling. It's It comes from his own weakness as a person. And to see him grow and overcome that and get back with his wife and learn who he really is, I think is quite satisfying for the audience. Learn his limitations and capabilities mm-hmm. What kind of man he is, yeah. Um, so talk to me about working with Matthew Weiner. I mean, we just mentioned that you were in it and then just talked about Mad Men and how much we love it. What about Matthew? Well, my first day on set, he came to talk to me in my trailer and he said, I don't know what you've heard about me before. He was like, um, but you know, like, and I was like, and then I was like, oh my God, like, is he really scary and really tough? Because like, when someone says, I don't know what you've heard about me before, but like, this is how I like to work. Very direct and a big personality. And I was a little nervous, but it was one of the most incredible working experiences I've had. I mean, the fact that he writes and directs means that you feel very safe. He's very specific about what he wants. And I just, I love him. And like, he's a dear friend of mine now. It was it was a it was a dream come true doing now that it's, show. It's eight episodes, right? Is it eight yeah. episodes? It's premiere on Amazon, I think, in like two weeks. Yeah, the first week of October. The first week of October. The tenth, maybe. And this is a show that's about each episode is a different uh, group of people or different characters, all of which believe that they are uh, the heirs or the you know descendants, descendants. of uh, the royal the royal Romanovs. Romanov family yes. in Russia. Mm-hmm. Okay. I only know my episode. It was the only one I got to read. Uh, so I know that there's one character in my episode who is a descendant of the Romanovs. He's married. And it's really how it's the conversation. The show is really about nature or nurture. So is what your your heritage or where you're from, how much of that influences who you are as a person now? In the, in, if it's your, you know, so if you're, if you're Jewish, let's say, how much of that has an influence on you in today, what your ancestors went through. I think that is the larger conversation of the show. It's such a cerebral idea for a television show. I love it. Like, only Amazon would give someone the the chance to make that. And I think it's because it's Matt Weiner as well. I think people trust him and they know that he... he uh, what I love about his work is that you don't need a gimmick when someone is a great storyteller and someone who understands human relationships and the light and dark in people the way he does so he can just write scenes between people that you're just it's so easy with his words you're like oh this is easy and delicious very clear Mm -hmm. his scenes are very clear uh as much as you could say there's ambiguity or the the characters are dimensional there's still the intentions and the motivations of characters scene by scene is are incredibly clear that's Mm -hmm. what i found so fulfilling about rewatching mad men is like versus so much of other television it didn't feel like it was trying to do multiple things and only succeeding at one Mm -hmm. it felt like very intentional and almost obvious at times but never in a uh, a, a way that didn't feel like I was watch. I wasn't watching something smart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I imagine that's what it's like working with him as a director too. It really is. Like he knows exactly what he wants, and he has a very clear because he writes the scenes as well. He knows how everything is supposed to look, and so when you block the scene, he's like, "Oh no, you were this side," because he's already had a vision. He's already seen it all, so it makes it quite easy. Whereas, you know, other times when you're shooting, you're finding what the scene is, and you don't have the writer there, or you do, and they don't. No, they they give you more freedom, which is sometimes nice. But there's something, there's something, there's a safety net when you know that the director uh, writer knows exactly 
how it's supposed to be. Oh, let's get some questions from our audience. Who has a question? Right here. Hi. Hi. <clears throat> Um, I was wondering if there were any roles that you haven't played yet that would be kind of like your dream role. That's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely a lot more that I want to do in my career. Uh, dream roles, it's hard to know until you see it. Um, and I don't really want to go through the history of like other parts that I would have liked to have played. But, you know, I, I definitely feel like there's a lot of great television right now and mini series. There's a lot of great story. I'd like to do some more Shakespeare and I'd definitely like to do some more theater. Um, but yeah, I guess that just, I feel like I've only just touched the surface of a lot of the roles I want to play. Uh, next question. Hi. Hi. Um, where did, where you, did come you come from? from? Uh, that was amazing. Thinking around. <laughs> yeah, you know. um, so I've heard that you uh, had a background in dancing. I'm wondering if um, now that you're an actress and how your dancing background has kind of informed um, like how you move physically through spaces when you're acting? Um. Um, that's a great question. Uh, I left dancing and I, after training hardcore in the contemporary and ballet, I didn't want to do it anymore. But it was a kickstart into my acting career. I mean, it helped get me uh, Black Swan and work with Darren Aronofsky. And I think it helps me a lot with the logistics of my job, like I will always be able to hit my mark without being able to see it. Like that's something that camera departments always say, but I think that's just because I there's a rhythm that I have when I move within a scene. Um, and I do think it helps with finding like, there was a, in Romanoff's Michelle, she used to be a dancer, the character. So she holds herself in a way that I probably don't anymore because it's been a while for me, but she holds herself in a way that a dancer does with their whole their core. Um, so yeah, I think it, it's something that I, I, I call upon when I need to, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one more. Hi, thanks for being Hi. here. Um, so I actually got the chance to watch the pilot um, and your character, I can't remember his name, but you're paired up essentially with um, the head of the heart surgery department. Yeah, yeah that's uh, Dr. Floyd Reynolds. Yeah, um, so you're paired up for the whole episode and you sort of see the dynamic between the characters and they sort of have, I don't know how much, I'm they have like sort of a will they, sort of won't they sort of vibe. So in terms of like the future um, of the season, will we see that play out and sort of how will that play out in the rest of the season? That's uh, they have. They have. They yeah, which I which I found interesting that you come into the pilot episode and there's a history between these characters. But I think what's great is that the the writers are still figuring it out as they get to know me and Jocko as actors, and it's a complicated relationship. But also because we work together, the relationship has to always be there. Whether sometimes there is tension because of what's going on personally between us. Um, but yet, yeah, we're shooting episode uh, six right now, and that is still a very complicated relationship. Janet, thanks so much for being here. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it was new so Amsterdam fun. Amsterdam premieres tomorrow night on NBC, right? And the Romanoffs on Amazon in early October. October 10th. October 10th. I'm pretty sure that's the date. Okay, <laughs> I can't wait to see it. Everybody, give a big round of applause for Janet Montgomery. Let's hear it. Thank you.